and welcome to the first episode of Fridays with Vaughn for 2022. Happy New Year. I hope your year is off to a great start. I'm your host, Fawn Lopez, publisher of Modern Healthcare and Vice President of Crane Communications. Thank you for joining us. Joining me today is Dr. Patrice Harris, co-founder and CEO of EMED and past president of the American Medical Association 2019 and 2020. EMED is a digital health company that provides rapid at home diagnostic testing, verified and validated test results, and enables quick access to treatment. Welcome, Patrice. I'm so excited to speak with you today. So let's get started. Well, thank you, Fawn, and Happy New Year to you. My first question to you is, um, you enter medicine out of a desire not just to serve an, an individual patient, but help treat company, uh, family and community issues. What drew you to uh, psychiatry? Well, Fawn, it was a television doctor that drew me to medicine. And some of the folks that maybe are my age or older will know this doctor and others may have to Google him, but uh, Dr. Marcus Welby was a TV doctor. And I saw in Dr. Welby his ability to not only take care of the patients that were in his exam rooms, but he cared about families and he cared about communities. And I said, wow, physicians, doctors can take care of their patients, but they also can have a broader impact on, on families in the community. And, and that drew me to medicine. I wanted to be a doctor uh, from, from then on. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. I didn't know that about, about Dr. Welby. Uh, yes. Welby. yes. That's awesome. You served in many leadership positions at the American Psychiatric Association and American Medical Association, in addition to leadership positions at the state level, prior to your term as president of the AMA. How do you feel these roles prepared you to lead the AMA during such an unprecedented time? And if you were able to go back uh, in time 10 years, what would you tell yourself about leadership that you didn't know then? Well, the one thing that I've always said, and I've had many detours on my journey, Fawn, I think you know that I did not go straight uh, through to medical school and that at some, actually several points in my journey, I was discouraged uh, from becoming a physician. Uh, but the one thing that I always say, and let me just say, I didn't appreciate it then, but I certainly appreciate it now, is that there's a learning opportunity in every setback. Actually, there should be a learning opportunity in every success, but there's certainly a learning opportunity in every setback. So I value all of the detours uh, that I took. Uh, some I didn't necessarily want to take the detours and others, others I did. And you mentioned uh, leadership positions and, and my many roles in organized medicine and around policy, because I will tell you that going through medical school and through the rigor of medical school and residency, your nose is to the grindstone. But the end of my residency, I went to the state capitol for, you know, doctor's day at the capitol and really had an aha moment about the importance of policy and how policy really shapes my ability, right? And my passion and my love for not only taking care of my patients, but doing the broader things around a community. So I think that um, I took all of the learning moments, all of those leadership roles in organized medicine. I was a lobbyist at the state capitol for several years. So I was really immersed in, in politics and policy. Um, and again, leading roles at APA and AMA really taught me about the importance of collaboration, right? And making sure that um, there were many voices in the room and making sure that um, my voice was heard. But I have to say, if I go back, I think I wasn't always uh, so assured of that, right? Even 10, 20 years ago that my, my voice uh, was worthy of being heard. Um, I was probably a little bit uh, more patient back then. So I would say, um, and the advice that I would say and the lesson that I've learned about leadership would be um, be authentic, 
be who you are and bring that, bring all of who you are in any leadership uh, role into the room because um, it's important, particularly now, Fawn, and as a woman of color, uh, we know that for so many years, um, there weren't many voices in the room that represented communities of color, represented women, represented other groups. And so I think that's important to bring that into the room as a leader, your your authentic voice, your narrative, your stories. Thank you so much. What a wonderful um, advice. I think we all, all of us women, women of color, uh, have always have had that that experience of wondering if um, our voice was um, good enough or our, our would be heard. So um, it's, it's so important. And if I could add one, and trusting that voice, Fawn, because, you know, oftentimes I, my in my experience, I was the only one that had this particular thought or this opinion, and you doubt yourself and you say, well, if I'm the only one that is worried about this investment or worried, you know, I, I think we should uh, go another way, perhaps I'm wrong. And I really uh, would say now uh, that I learned that you should trust that authentic voice and, and voice it. Now, you you might not always um, be uh, totally right. You might not always win the day, but it's important to make sure you um you amplify uh, th th those thoughts. The, the times of the regrets I've had in my life are the times that I knew that there was something that wasn't quite right or knew that I uh, should have spoken up and I did not. And that takes courage, right? So, um, so important. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic dominated most of your term as AMA president. So my next question, uh, A, is what do you consider your greatest success from that time to be? And what was the most important lesson learned? You talked about a little bit about collaboration that you passed on to your successors. You know, as, and this has occurred from feedback from family and friends and a lot of colleagues. You know, I did have the opportunity to um, be in the public eye, uh, to be in the media. And consistently, I've heard you were a calm, steady voice. When you were on, I listened. Um, you were not, uh, you didn't, you, you weren't flame throwing, uh, but it was about being that calm and steady voice. And so I'm most proud of that because this pandemic we had not seen since, you know, 1918. And um, it was scary. Listen, I was scared from time to time, especially at the very beginning as a physician, you know, we are used to diagnosing the problem and fixing it, right? Maybe not immediately, but having it, and we did not do that. And so, listen, we were all a little afraid and worried, but, um, you know, I think it's important, and I have said this many times, if physicians don't run away, and I would say public health and, and nurses and all health professionals, we don't run away from problems, particularly health problems, we run towards them, and that's what we all did. And, and for me, being a calm and steady uh, voice um, was 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 critical, as others have said to me, and important. So I'm most proud of that. Uh, one of my uh, best friends from college said her mother said, uh, "I'm going to wait and see what Dr. Harris said, and then what she says, and I'm I'm going to do it." And that you know, it's a little, it's it's a lighthearted, but but it's very powerful. Well, your calm um, voice and manner really helped help me personally. Whenever I saw you on CNN, on TV, it, 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 it it's comforting. And, and you asked, and I, I'm so glad, you, you, and you asked the lesson learned. And, and I will say, Fawn, I hope there are a lot of lessons uh, learned. Um, we must do you know, what we call you know, an after action report. And that's everyone, you know, from the manufacturers, business as a country, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we do that review um, and, and learn a lot of lessons. But one critical lesson, especially on the health side and the public health side, is, is communication. Yeah. You know, I don't think, myself included, we did 
of course we didn't do a perfect job, but I, but I do look back and say, we could have improved how we communicated at the very beginning, e even though it would change. I know I said, there's some people are critical of the mass thing. Listen, those things have to change because uh, you know, when evidence change, our recommendations change in, in healthcare, that that we should all hope for. We hope for progress. But I think we could have sort of said, all right, for the next six weeks, um, this is going to happen. And then for the next six weeks. And I think we could have been better about metrics, um, you know, when we get to, and I'm just sort of giving an example. Uh, but listen, what, what our goal is, is a 5% positivity rate. And when we get there, you know, we'll do X, Y, and Z. So I would just say communication is is certainly something that we need to improve upon. That's a, that's a one of the many lessons that I learned during this pandemic. I couldn't agree more. Um, so I know that improving children's uh, mental health, especially for children in communities of color, is a lifelong passion for you. How do you feel the pandemic and the increased police violence that has been occurring in those communities has impacted children's mental health uh, and, and, and in, in the short and long term. And what do you feel are the greatest priorities when it comes to helping to address those impacts? You know, Vaughn, when I was inaugurated in June of 2019 uh, there in Chicago, um, I said, in addition to elevating and talking about the AMA's strategic priorities, I wanted to also amplify three priorities. Again, they were consistent with the AMA's priorities. And number one was the importance of mental health as a part of overall health care. The second was around health inequities, right, and the importance of diversity in the physician workforce, but not as just a checkbox, right? We, we need a certain number of women a certain number of um, Hispanic physicians, Black physicians, but really in the service of getting us to health equity. And the third was the importance of trauma and particularly childhood trauma. Now recall that was June of 2019 that I said I wanted to elevate those things. And of course, none of us would have wished uh, this pandemic on our world, but those three areas were highlighted. And so, uh, you know, all of those areas around children's mental health, really, there, there is some uh, connection there. First, of course, obviously mental health, but we have to make sure that it is integrated into overall health. And I think uh, now everyone realizes mental health is critically important. We, people were beginning to recognize that pre-pandemic. And then the importance of trauma. This pandemic has been traumatic for all of us, our, but with a lens on our children, their lives uh, were disrupted. All of our lives were disrupted, but the children, um, you know, it couldn't couldn't see their friends in school and just missed a lot of those very important milestones. So I think this pandemic is certainly going to have a long lasting impact on children. And we need to, you know, we talk a lot about pandemic preparedness. And I think that we need to have a plan, almost a, a Marshall plan, if you will, around mental health preparedness because pre-pandemic, we, we did not have the resources and we don't now. And so I hope that as a society, and it is an all of society approach, business, again, industry, government, individuals, we need to make sure we have workforce. I think technology, uh, you, you noted, and we'll talk a little bit about my, um, my, my new company, but um, you know, I've been talking about technology and the importance of technology in healthcare. So we're gonna have to bring all of these resources to bear to make sure everyone, but particularly our children have the resources that they need. And I'll say one more thing, Fawn, because we so often when it comes to mental health, children's mental health, we need a diagnosis or we wait until the um, you know situation warrants a significant intervention. And I really want us to have almost a public health approach to mental health and that we do some things that are proactive and comprehensive um, when it comes to mental health. I hope so too. And thank you for your work in, in, in that area. After leaving the AMA, you co-founded um, EMED to facilitate um, and improve the accuracy of at-home uh, COVID testing. How does at-home testing combat, and speaking of health equity, uh, healthcare inequity? 
So as I've said on many occasions, even prior to co-founding and being the CEO of EMA, there's so much promise in technology, right, to solve problems, right? We we all love technology and there's a new gadget every day and gadgets are fun, uh, but uh, we have to make sure that when we use technology and innovation in healthcare, um, that we ensure the promise and minimize any peril. One of those perils, by the way, is, is worsening health inequities. Uh, but I co-founded the company with some other brilliant, smart folks uh, because we saw a problem and we wanted to use uh, technology and innovation to solve a problem, right? Not invent a shiny new object, which again, shiny new objects are great. And the problem that we saw, we were thinking about actually um, using technology pre-COVID, but COVID presented an opportunity. You and I saw, and unfortunately, we're still seeing long lines to get access to tests, right? Yeah. People their cars, um, and they were waiting 10 hours. And I remember even thinking that, so even people were waiting, that means they have the privilege, although that's a horrible thing to have to do, but they had cars so they could wait You were in their cars. Um, and they had the privilege of spending 10 hours, even though that's a misery for everyone. You know, many folks can't do that, right? They can't leave work. Right. They have, you know, responsibilities, family and personal responsibilities. So we wanted to be able to solve the problem. We thought about, we thought how we could develop a platform um, software platform uh, to bring COVID-19 testing at home. And we thought this is just the first of many, right? Because everyone's thinking about virtual care, right? And we see COVID accelerated that there are opportunities and it's not either or, you know, Fawn, we spend a lot of time, I'm always frustrated with arguing uh, either or yeah. when it's both and let's have a comprehensive system so that we can reach the most people. So those are all the things we were thinking about at EMED, improving access, uh, working towards equitable um, access, making the right thing to do, the easy thing to do by developing a platform. And then again, just specifically talking about COVID-19 testing. If you think about it, if you're going to a location, right, a physical location, if you can get there, if you don't have transportation as a barrier, with COVID, there's a risk that um, if you are positive, you may spread it to others. And if you're yeah. negative, Congress, and so we just wanted to solve a lot of those problems. And so we developed this platform for rapid um, at-home diagnostic uh, testing. And we believe this is, the again, the first of many um, opportunities to test at home um, and then take the next action, right? And and when we did, we worked in a partnership to make sure that um, folks could get back from international travel, yeah. make that worry free. We know that uh, with the two new medications from, from Merck and Pfizer, uh, just like Tamiflu, by the way, you're going to need to start those meds within the first five days. That means you're going to need uh, to get diagnosed quickly uh, you know, to get to um, your physician to get the, the treatment that you need. So that's what we're working on at EMED. But in the beginning, yes, it was about improving access. And we always have a lens toward, uh, we call it democratizing healthcare and equitable access. And what a great um, uh, mission that is for uh, for you, for EMED. Um, it's at home testing, rapid testing is so vital right at this point in, in, in the pandemic. So thank you for your work in, in, in that. I have a last question for you, and this is about um, advice for women, uh, especially women of color who are preparing for their next step into an executive position. What advice would you give to, to a woman of color? I would say, um, you know, create your own uh, posse, if you if you will. Um, you know, I uh, the night of my inauguration on the front of my program, I had a quote from one of my favorite poems about leadership, and it said, "Leaders stand between the no longer and the not yet," and that is a lonely place to be. And I have. Uh, experience that uh, a lot through my career when you're maybe ahead of your time or you're the only in the room and you're putting forth ideas that um, not getting a lot of support. So leadership can be 
a lonely place. I will say I wouldn't trade the opportunities I've had for anything, um, but it can be a lonely place. And so I would say get your posse around here, your circle of support. Um, by the way, that circle of support um, include can include men and women, but get your circle of support, your personal board of directors, whatever you want to call it, um, and then sometimes bounce things off of them. I, I always, uh, you know, I, I say, listen, here's how I responded in this situation. What are your thoughts on that? And by the way, you should make sure that people in this circle of support are willing to be honest with you, right? Uh, yeah. Even when you might not want to hear what they have to say, but uh, that that's my one advice is make sure you have a circle of support um, around you. Great advice. Thank you. So I hope you know how, uh, what a big fan I am of you. Um, so it has been a wonderful um, uh, time. Uh, I've enjoyed talking with you and it's such a pleasure and an honor. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule and sharing with us, Patrice. Well, Fawn, it was my pleasure. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. As always, I look forward to seeing you on the next Fridays with Fawn. And please don't forget to mark your calendars for our 2022 Women Leaders in Healthcare Conference. Until next time, thank you. Bye-bye.